take your Bible tonight and turn to the book of Psalm 136. Last week we uh, did the first nine verses, and tonight we're going to look at the second section of this uh, particular chapter and get the uh, what we call the illustrated form or the picture form. You know, someone made the statement one time, a picture is worth what? A thousand words. Well, that's true. That's one of the reasons that uh, we like to look at pictures because it kind of gives us a, a more total view of everything. It's like uh, taking and, uh, I guess, uh, talking about a person, but having that person meet you face to face is such a greater experience. It's like, for example, also I could uh, say, uh, uh, I want you to see a picture of my wife, but if you saw my wife, you get a, a better understanding of that person. So uh, that's the same way it is when we take and we look at pictures out of the Bible uh, that might give us a little bit more understanding, but if we could see, and one of these days we'll see the Lord face to face, amen? amen. And then we'll understand things in a greater way. But if you look there's Psalm 136, and beginning in verse number 10, I'm going to read a few verses, and then I'm going to have a word of prayer, and then we're going to get into our study tonight by God's mercy illustrated. An illustration is uh, really a simple story, a picture of something that might help us to have a greater understanding for our lives. And when we talk about mercy, sometimes we don't grasp that. I mean, when we just use the term mercy, we don't get the full picture. Well, the psalmist here in Psalm 136 takes him now, in verse 10 down to the end of the chapter, he takes and he kind of draws a picture and illustrates it through some things that took place in the past in regards to the people of Israel, that God showed his mercy. Uh, I can I could I could just use this statement tonight. God is a merciful God. Now that's a simple statement, but to see in vivid form or a picture that shows God's mercy helps me to understand God in a greater way. Well, we're going to do that here tonight in Psalm chapter one thirty six, begin to verse number ten. Look at it. It says, To him that smote Egypt in the firstborn, for his mercy endureth forever. Now, I, I want to stop there before I uh, go a little bit further and uh, uh, remind you, if you can think back, if you visualize in your mind that night when the Lord took and brought the death angel there to the land of Egypt. The people of Israel had taken, if you get in your mind, they had taken the blood and struck it over the, the doorpost. And when the death angel came over those homes, he just passed over it. But all the other homes, he struck dead the firstborn of everything. Doesn't matter if it was a person or if it was cattle or whatever. And that begins to give us a, a visual there. Now look at verse 11, and we'll uh, come back here in a few minutes and give you a greater understanding. It says, Brought out Israel from among them, for his mercy endureth forever. With a strong hand and with a stretched out arm, for his mercy endureth forever. Now those are just descriptive statements of how he went about bringing them out of Egypt. To him which divided the Red Sea into parts, for his mercy endureth forever. And made Israel to pass through the midst of it, for his mercy endureth forever. But overthrew Pharaoh and his host in the Red Sea, for his mercy endured forever. To him which led his people through the wilderness, for his mercy endureth forever. To him which smote great kings, for his mercy endureth forever. And slew famous kings, for his mercy endureth forever. Sihon, king of the Amorites, for his mercy endureth forever. And Og, the king of Bashan, for his mercy endureth forever. And gave the land for an inheritance, for his mercy endureth forever. Even heritage unto uh, Israel his servant, for his mercy endureth forever. Who remembered us in our our low estate, for his mercy endureth forever, and hath redeemed us from our enemies, and from our mercy, for his mercy endureth forever. Who giveth food to all flesh, for his mercy endureth forever. O oh, give thanks unto the God of heaven, for his mercy endureth forever. Now, let me make this statement, we'll have prayer. Why does he continually say, for his mercy endureth forever? Because after he has given the illustration of how God showed his mercy, he says, the Lord's going to keep on doing the same thing. 
That's for you and me. Because remember in the New Testament says those were written for our end samples. In other words, examples of what God can do in our lives as well. So, let's have a word of prayer and we'll get into the lesson. Father, we thank you for your word. I pray that you would take your word tonight and make it clear to us and understandable. That, Lord, that we can see the greatness of you, that your mercy does endure forever. And we may share it with someone else and illustrate it. Because sometimes people just don't see it unless they see it in picture form. So, we pray you take your word. And draw us closer to you tonight. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, there are many references throughout the Bible that we see concerning God's mercy. But the greatest that we can see is God literally working in the lives of people. For example, uh, how can I help people to understand about salvation uh, in a literal way? I can tell them what happened to me. I can show them what happened to me. That's the reason the Bible tells us, let your light so shine before men that they may see your what? Good works. That's illustrative form. I mean, they, I can say, yeah, I'm a Christian, but my life gives an illustration. My life gives a picture to people of really what salvation is all about. Now, if you look here tonight, beginning at verse number 10 and 11, the first illustration or picture God uh, brings before you and me is that he brought Israel out of bondage. Uh, there is a story found in the book of Exodus chapter 20 that God spoke all these words saying, I'm the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. He brought us out of bondage of sin, you and me. So he illustrates the fact that the people of Israel were down in Egypt. Now, someone answered me, you've heard me before, so let's see if you can remember. How many years were the people of Israel in bondage down there in Egypt? 400 plus years. We don't know exactly because the Bible but does. 400 plus years, the people of Israel were down in Egypt. Now, what were some illustrations that showed they were in bondage? Talk with me. What were some things that, that, uh, that pictured them being in bondage? What were some things that happened there in Egypt? Did Pharaoh make them do certain things? What did he make them do? Okay. They had to build the, the we believe, the Sphinx and the, the Great Pyramids. That's uh, one of the things. But then he made them do something. He made them go out and get their own straw. Go out and get their own materials to do it with. Before it was furnished to them. But he put them in greater bondage by making them uh, go get the, the materials to build uh, those great uh, the buildings or whatever he had them do in Egypt. And whatever kind of work it was, he put them in bondage and made them literally slaves in doing the things there in Egypt. So he says, uh, the first thing is that you and I have to look at the fact that Egypt is always a type of what? What is Egypt a type of? A type of world. As long as we're in this world, we're kind of in bondage, all right? We're in bondage, number one, to the curse of sin. But, in a certain sense, God says he delivered us from the bondage of sin, didn't he? Uh, take your Bible and turn over to the book of Galatians, if you would. Chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4, and uh, look down to verse number 9. Galatians 4, verse 9. He wants us to see the illustrations in behalf of the people of Israel that we get a grip to not let those things continually be in our lives and let sin dominate us and uh, overcome us and put us into a, a straitjacket, so to speak. All right, read Galatians 4, 9 with me. But now, after you have known God, or rather known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements whereunto you desire again to be in what? bondage. 
In other words, God saved us from sin. Why do we want to continue to participate in something that would be of a sinful nature? Uh, let me read you this verse in Romans 5, 6 through 11. Listen. For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for good men, man, some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love towards us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much being then being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only, not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Now, when the people of Israel, excuse me, were down in Egypt, God had to make an atonement for them. In doing so, here's what he did. He said, I want you to take the blood of the first year of a lamb, and I want you to dip that hyssop in there, and I want you to strike it over the doorpost. That's going to be an atonement that you will not die. Because the death angel this night is going to go through the, all Egypt and ever who doesn't have the blood applied and blood was always the atonement, see. And so God says, if you don't do that, you're in bondage and you're going to die. So you and I have this picture here. Look at verse 11. It says, and brought out Israel from among them. Now, God uses people to help people to get out of bondage, right? Who did God use to bring the people of Israel out of bondage? All right, Moses. Uh, God had used a man. Now, God uses you and I, or you and me, I should say, you and me to take the gospel to people, to show them the way of salvation, to bring them out of bondage. And that's why they need to hear the good news. If the Son shall make you free, come on, say it with me. If the Son shall make you free, you will be free indeed. All right? So he brings you and I out of bondage because of that. And so uh, he pictures there in verse 10 and 11 what he did for the people of Israel. He brought them out of bondage from Israel, I mean from Egypt. He brought all Israel out. And we don't know exactly how many people. There were three million people plus. Now think about that. Over a 400-some year period, they, had, they, they, they went from 17 people to over 3 million people that came out of Egypt. How would you like to have led th uh, 3, 000, I mean, 3 million people out of a place? Now, I want to tell you, that, that took a lot of people out of Egypt. But remember, those people mostly lived in what we call Goshen. All right? They kind of lived away from the Egyptians, though Goshen is still in Egypt. God took, and there were three million plus people that he brought out of that great Egypt bondage because God says, his mercy endureth forever. See? And he wants us to understand that bondage is a terrible thing. And we need to help people to get out of bondage. Now, look at Roman numeral 2, verses 12 through 15. He brought them through the Red Sea. Now, we talked about them bringing out of bondage out of Egypt through the fact of the death angel. He had given, ten, uh, that's, that was the tenth plague that God actually brought upon the people of Israel, uh, upon the people of Egypt, excuse me. Sometimes we don't get that. Pharaoh had hardened his heart, not only Pharaoh, but all the people there in Egypt, because they enjoyed the people of Israel doing their work for them. Huh? And you can understand a little bit why uh, the Pharaoh didn't want to let the people of Israel go. So then he comes to verse number 12 and uh, down through verse 15, and he talks about it. He, he paints another picture. He says, look back there at the Red Sea. Here were the people that came down to the Red Sea, and they stopped. Now, 
It took a little while. We, we think that, man, just a few hours they went down there. No, it took them days to get down to Egypt. I mean, you're moving three million people. And by the way, folks, with three million people, they took cattle. They took belongings. Matter of fact, they took a lot of things because when they left, the Egyptians gave them things. They gave them gold. They gave them uh, all kinds of different things to take along with them. So, uh, uh, listen, when you get up to move, you don't move in one night. Huh? It takes days. It may take you a few weeks. Man, I'll tell you what. I, I don't even want to think about moving. <laughs> all the things we had to pack up, you know. But uh, here he says, uh, and he brought Israel from among them. And then it comes down to verse 12. He says, with a strong hand on the stretched down arm, for his mercy endureth forever. To him which divide the Red Sea into parts, for his mercy endureth forever. And made Israel pass through the midst of it, for his mercy endureth forever. But overthrew Pharaoh and his hosts in the Red Sea, for his mercy endureth forever. Now, he took the people of Israel... And when they were standing there in the Pharaoh's army, and can't you imagine, get in your mind if you would, here's this great host of soldiers coming after the people of Israel in their chariots and on, on foot, and they were pursuing after the people of Israel, and they were going to deal with them. Ever how they were going to, they were going to bring them back or what they were going to do or kill them. Uh, but God says, uh, it's going to be all right. And Moses stood there and he began to plead for the people. And the Lord said, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. What happened? He told Moses, stretch forth your scepter, your rod. And the Red Sea parted. Now here's where the miracle comes in. We think sometimes just of the water parting. But think about all that sludge and mud. Huh? And the Bible says they went over on dry shod. Now, folks, when you start driving a cart with maybe an ox or whatever they were pulling out, I would assume it was probably an ox, uh, going through mud is pretty hard. I'm reading a story right now. Uh, I, I've gotten in the mood of reading books besides theology books and um, uh, I'm reading one about uh, what's that one Little House on the Prairie uh, uh, what, what's the one Ingalls what, what's the name anyway it's called The Farmer and uh, she wrote a lot of books but one, the one I'm reading right now is called The Farmer and they they've had a lot of rain but they got to get those that field broke up and so forth because it's spring and they got to get they, they got to be able to get the crops and so forth. They can't do it with her two horses because the horses they, they have wider feet and they were just getting slugging down in, in the mud and so forth. The guy sells these two horses and buys two mules, brother Ed, because a mule has smaller feet and can go through mud much easier, and that's why he did. Can't you imagine when the people of Israel, if they had to go through that Red Sea with those animals they had, they just kind of sink down that mud. But you know what the Bible says? They went over on dry shod, dry ground. I mean, it was just as smooth. I mean, the wheels didn't get stuck. Everything was just right. But after the people of Israel got through a certain spot, the Egyptians came along. What happened to their chariot wheels? They fell off. Some of them got stuck. I mean, just because God let the th stuff return. God says, picture that in your mind. His mercy endureth forever. He showed mercy on the people of Israel that he permitted them to go through with no problem at all. But when the Egyptians came after them in their chariots, then they, they got stuck in the mud. See? God changed it from dry shod to mud. His mercy endureth forever. So the people of Israel showed that. Now, he says, they passed through the midst of it. For his mercy endureth forever. But read verse 15 with me. 
but overthrew Pharaoh and his host. Now say that again. What? In the Red Sea. That's the reason I said when they got into the Red Sea, it became muddy again. And then, of course, the water came over them and drowned them. You see, God was taking care of his people because his mercy endure forever. He said he would take care of them. He said he's going to get them to the promised land. He's going to take care of them. See? And you and I, God is a great deliverer because of his mercies in our life. There's nothing that you and I face in our lives that God can't deliver us from when we let him be in control. When we are obedient to do exactly what he told us to do. Uh, Mo uh, Moses told the people, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. And when they did, God showed his mercy in performing and uh, bringing them through the Red Sea. Now, look at verse uh, 16 there. He gives us another picture. He led them and preserved their lives through the wilderness. You say, why God brought them through the Red Sea, took, overcome, overcame that obstacle. Why did he bring them into the wilderness? Because of their unbelief. Whenever you and I, God brings us through one thing, if we get a heart of unbelief, guess what? We're back in trouble again. See? We're back in a place that we're going to have to look to Him, to trust Him to take care of us and get us out of it. See? Our problem is we often forget God doesn't care for us anymore. You ever feel like that? You ever feel like that God doesn't care for you anymore? Sure. But he does. Why? His mercy endureth forever. If we can keep that in our thinking, keep that in our hearts, it'll change our lives. So he led them to preserve their lives. All right, now how did he do that? Uh, there are several instances, if you'll think, about, and I'll give you opportunity to respond. What were some ways that God showed his mercy as the people of Israel went through the wilderness? Think about it a little bit. What did he do for them? Let me ask it in this way. How did he lead the people of Israel? How did he lead them of a day? Cloud by day, pillar of fire by night. Okay? Even of a night, he wanted them to travel. And he provided light for them. God took care of them that way. Yeah, Brother Ed? You're getting ahead of me on this. <laughs> That's okay, because that was one thing. Their shoes didn't wear out, their clothes didn't wear out. We'll, we'll look at some scripture in just a minute on that. What are some other things that God did to preserve them as they were on this trip to the promised land? What? Fed them. Okay. What, how did he feed them? With manna. Manna. Okay. He didn't feed them with bread as they usually had. And we'll look at verses in just a few minutes on that. He provided them for, uh, a bread. I mean, uh, manna. What else did he provide for them? Quail. He provided them meat, didn't he? Okay. Quail. All right. What else did he provide for them? Oh, that's good. Yeah. They, even when they got to the place, the water was what? What happened to the water? Bitter. It was bitter. All right. Did God take care of that? What did he do to take care of it? He showed Moses and the leaders to take a certain tree and throw it in the water. Remember that? And it took away the bitterness. The place is called Mara, meaning bitter. Okay? God provided each thing that they needed as they traveled. Now, we're going we're gonna to look, uh, look at this a little bit in regards to the scriptures, how he did that, how he provided for them. Uh, let's uh, take and uh, look at a few verses. Uh, turn over to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 29, verse. Deuteronomy 29. 
This is the first thing he had to do as he provided for the people. Deuteronomy chapter 29. Look down verse number 4. All right, Brother Ed, would you read verses 4 through 6? And everybody follow along if you would. 4 through 6? Yeah. Right. Says, Yet the Lord hath not given you a heart to perceive, and eyes to see, and ears to hear unto this day. Uh, and I have led you for 40 years in the wilderness. Your clothes are not waxed old upon you, and thy shoes is not waxed old upon thy feet. You have not eaten bread, neither have you drunk wine or strong drink, that you might know that I am the Lord your God. Now, we're going to do a little. In Deuteronomy, I want everybody to turn to Deuteronomy 7, verse 15. All right? And I want you to answer me after uh, uh, we read the verse, uh, what God did there in that particular instance. Uh, Deuteronomy 7, 15. All right, everybody there? All right, Brother David, would you read Deuteronomy 7, verse 15 for us? And, and the Lord will take away from thee all sickness and will put none of the evil diseases of Egypt, which thou knowest, upon thee, but will lay them upon all them that hate thee. Okay, during that time, they didn't even have to have a doctor. <laughs> Didn't have to have a chiropractor or anything like that. But God provided for the people a protection from sickness and illness and evil things that would uh, harm their bodies and so forth as they left Egypt. Uh, and Brother Ed, a while ago, uh, mentioned about uh, nobody needed shoes. And uh, the scripture says in the book of Deuteronomy, you're in Deuteronomy, turn over to chapter 33. Chapter 33, and look down at verse 25. So, um, Tony, would you read that for us? Uh, Deuteronomy 33, verse 25. Thy shoes shall be iron and brass, and as thy days, so shall thy strength be. All right, God was going to take care of that and meet each need. All right, now, turn back to Deuteronomy chapter 8. Now, I know I'm jumping around here because of the things that I'm sharing with you here. But look at Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse number 4. Brenda, would you read that for us when you get there? Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 4. They didn't, they didn't do that. Look over at Deuteronomy 29. I'm, I know I'm getting you to use your Bible tonight, but I want you to go over there. And uh, this is pertaining to the same one. So uh, when you get over there, Brenda, read verse 5. And I have led you 40 years in the wilderness. Your clothes are not waxen old upon you, and thy shoe is not waxen old upon thy foot. All right, now, uh, honey, more. Read Deuteronomy 29, verse 6 for us. Ye have not eaten bread, neither have ye drunk wine or strong drink, that ye might know that I am the Lord your God. Okay, the whole thing, the whole deal of his provisions and so forth that he was doing for the people was for what reason? Okay, that's, that's what it says in the latter part of the verse, doesn't it? That I am, that, excuse me, that ye might know that I am the Lord your God. Everything that God was doing and providing for the people was to get them to a heart of belief and get them away from unbelief. Was there a time in the wilderness wanderings that the people of Israel wanted to turn back to Egypt? Yes. Yes. Isn't that just like us, though? We're no different than they are. 
we sometimes want to turn them back to the ways of the world because we think things are going to be better when things really are worse when we turn away from the Lord. Because God says in the book of Philippians chapter 4 and verse number 19, but my God shall supply what? All your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. The problem of it is we see things that are not really a need in our life, but we gravitate towards them because of our natural man. And that's when we need to turn our heart towards the Lord and ask him to help us. Uh, God protected them. Day and night, he protected them in all types of situations. Now, turn back to the book of Psalms. Now, remember, we're looking at uh, this chapter in light in verses 10 down through the end of the chapter in light of uh, illustrations that shows that God's mercy endureth forever. God wanted the people of Israel to notice that all their life that he's right there to take care of them. He's going to meet each need of the life. And each thing, he says, is to bring back to the memory of you and me of what he did for the people of Israel. All right, the very first thing was, he did what down in Egypt? What was the first thing we talked about? He smote the Egyptians, right? He took care of them and the fact that they did not, uh, you know, they didn't use the blood as an atonement. But because you and I are blood-bought, God, now listen, are you listening? God is obligated to take care of you and me. We are his blood-bought children. And God made himself obligated when he told the people of Israel, if you take and you put that blood on the, on the door uh, mantle, uh, he says, I'll take care of you. The death angel will pass over. And then we saw the second thing was what? He first took and he took, uh, took uh, uh, and uh, brought the people out of Egypt. What did he do then? Led them through what? The Red Sea, right? Okay, that's the second thing. Now, why he tells us that over and over and over again out through the Bible, how, what he did to help us. I want to ask you a question. Is God still the same God back then as he is today? Yes. How do we know that? What? Oh, he said he would. It's the same yesterday. Thank you, Brandon. I was waiting for somebody to say it. And God changeth not, right? God doesn't change in his character. And since he did it for the people of Israel, they are our in samples, the Bible says, that we might believe also and trust him. So, up this particular point, he's brought them through the Red Sea, he brought them through the wilderness, he supplied their needs. Now, we come down to the next point in verse number 23. Uh, actually, let, let's jump back up to uh, how he took care of them uh, from the enemy. Look at verse uh, 17. To him which smote great kings for his mercy and doeth forever. And then he begins in verse number 19 and verse 20, and he tells us some of those kings. Folks, whoever comes on as president of the United States, God's going to take care of us. Okay? God is going to take care of his children if we'll do what's right. Now, that doesn't, and I, I'm just coming right here, I can say this, I can't give you a candidate to, uh, uh, to vote for, but I can tell you this, you ought to vote. You ought to vote for the best choice, okay? I know we don't have much of a choice, but we still are obligated to do that. Patrick can't tell you, but CBL tell you. <laughs> Ed can tell you, okay? Uh, I, I can't do it, but line it up. And look at the situation. And let God speak to your heart. But everybody, d d listen. Don't stay from voting. You ought to vote. Every person ought to vote. Now, look at the next thing here he says. He says, okay, God took care of the people of Israel from these wicked kings. And he mentions them right here. Now, that doesn't just mean that uh, God will take care of us from authorities, but God said he would take care of us from our enemies. 
Who's our greatest enemy? Satan. Satan. And the Bible gives a scripture over and over and over again how he'll take care of us. Uh, that's why we're to put on the whole armor of God in Ephesians chapter 6. Uh, that's why in the book of James, he says that we're to take in, uh, uh, in James, what is, uh, what's the verse there? Let me flip over real quickly and give it to you. My mind is slipping me there. Um, oh, verse 7. Submit yourselves therefore to God and resist the devil and what will happen? He'll flee from you. Okay, our problem is we have a hard time resisting, don't we? Because we try to do it in ourselves rather than the power of the Lord and through the Word of God. Now, look back, if you would, there in the Scripture uh, that we talk about. God takes care of us in our low times. Look at verse 23. Who remembered us in our low estate. It's in the low times that we fail to look up. But many times, that's the, that, that's the way God has to bring us down to a low time so we look up. The only time some people look to God when they're on the bed of affliction. But it says here, who remembered us in our low estate. So when you get to those low times in your life, don't throw, a, don't throw your hands up and say, I'm quitting. That's the time to look to God and say, Lord, you're in control. You're the blessed controller of all things. You're, 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 you're ahead of things. We just don't see the big picture right now. We don't see how you're going to take care of this problem that we're dealing with. But God said he'd take care of us, didn't he? And the thing about this that encourages me, when I sit down here, guess who's sitting by me? The Lord says, I will never what? Leave thee, nor forsake thee. I mean, man, he's right there. He's with us. No matter what we're going through, God is there to take care of us and help us in the low times. But look at something else in verse number 24. And hath redeemed us from our enemies, whatever your enemy is. Then verse 25, who giveth food to all flesh. God's going to supply your needs, see, God's going to take care of that situation that you're facing with your need that you have. Why? Why will he do that? For his mercy endureth forever. Mercy, you say, I don't deserve it. <laughs> That's why mercy and grace are there. Mercy is even withholding something that we do deserve. Man, sometimes we deserve a good old spanking. Sometimes we deserve the hammer to come down. But I'm glad God doesn't always bring the hammer down. Amen? I'd be destroyed. I mean, he just mashed me down the ground. All right? So, in all these scriptures here, he's trying to paint a picture and use illustrations from the people of Israel to help you and me to know that he's right there to take care of the problem. Now, look at the very last verse. What should be the result of God showing us all these pictures and illustrations of the people of Israel and what he did, starting back to the, uh, at the place of Egypt, all the way up to getting them into the, uh, uh, the promised land, God took care of them. God met their needs. God protected them from the enemies and so forth. What should be the end result because his mercy doth endure forever? Look at the last verse, verse 26. Let's read it together. Oh, give thanks unto the God of heaven for his mercy. When was the last time... When God brought you really out of something, you took time just to stop and said, Lord, thank you for delivering me from that. Thank you. I mean, you were almost hit by a car. Did you take time to maybe pull over and stop and say, Lord, thank you. That you protected me that I didn't get hit head on or I wasn't in that accident. Or if you were in the accident and you came out, 
You better thank the Lord. I mean, he was good to you, right? In protecting you and taking care of you. And so often we forget about that. Uh, let me give you the illustration. And some of you heard it before and some of you haven't. I can't get it out of my mind because of the fact that I, I wouldn't be here probably today. But when I was in college, I was going down through London, Kentucky. And after you get out of London, Kentucky, at that particular time, they had a stretch of interstate. And I, as I was going through London, Kentucky, it was kind of a drizzle and so forth. And uh, a car was in front of me. The light turned green. And so I started going. Well, he put his brakes on. And I hit in the back of, that, uh, of the, I think it was a van. Well, knocked my front headlight out. He didn't break it, just knocked it out. So I went up to the guy and I says, I hit you. He said, he says, that's all right. He just pulled away. Well, I pulled over to the side and looked at my headlight and I just stuck it back up in the bracket and tightened it up. And I said, Lord, thank you. Went on down the road, got on the interstate, didn't go too far on the interstate until the cars were backed up. And I got out of my car, and I asked the guy that was there at, in front of me or wherever, it might have been two lanes or whatever, how many lanes or what it was. There was a 10-car pileup. And I asked him, when did it happen? He said, just a few minutes ago. What do you think I said? Thank you, Lord, because I could have been in that 10-car pileup. I believe with all my heart, I'll never forget it as long as I live. I believe God permitted that to happen so I wouldn't be in that 10-car pileup. And I've seen that time after time how the Lord, one day, uh, real quickly here, I only have three minutes, my wife and I were going to school one day over at Central Baptist Academy. It was Central Baptist Schools at that time. And we were going up uh, uh, up towards Winton Road. I forget that major road there. I don't know. It's not Coleraine Avenue, but it's Winton Road. No, Winton was the other one. Anyway, we were going up this road, and uh, I was, uh, I forget exactly how it happened, but there was a car here, and this car got in the wrong lane and started coming right at us. Honestly, I do not know how I got through it. It was like my car must have turned sideways, you know, to get through. There was no way I should have hit him head on. That was the grace of God. That was the mercy of God. God takes care of it. And I'll tell you what. Immediately, I thank the Lord for, for protecting us. And you probably had similar incidents, but I'm just saying, I'm thankful for the mercy of the Lord, aren't you? I'm grateful for the mercy of the Lord endures forever. Amen. And maybe you can think back tonight and get some mental pictures of how God has taken care of you and met a need when you didn't know where the next dime was coming or the next uh, piece of food was coming. I can tell you one illustration after another. The Lord has just done so many things for us. I remember, I, I got to tell you this one. Mona and I, when Mona had cancer, we had to go to either West Lafayette, Indiana, or up to Zion, Illinois. The first, uh, how many of you remember or have seen on TV uh, the, uh, uh, let's see, what are they called now? Cancer Centers of America. How many of you? The origination of uh, that particular hospital Original name was International Hospital in Zion, Illinois. Every street is a biblical name in Zion, Illinois. That's where Mona went. And uh, anyway, we, did, we got to the place we didn't even have a car. We did not have a car. And there was a family in the school there. I taught their kids. Their last name was Mays. You remember them, honey? The Mays kids? Anyway... He loaned us his station wagon and said, use it as long as you want to use it. And we had taken a trip. I don't know if it, like I said, I don't know if it was up Zion, Illinois, or if it was the West Lafayette to see our doctor there. We were coming back, and the car just stopped. I mean, it just flat stopped. And I said, Lord, I don't know what we're going to do. 
we got to get back because we've got to go, we got to get back home. It's getting late and so forth. And I said, I, I just said, Lord, you got to take care of it. I took, turned the key, and I started right back up again. And we went on down the road and got home. The Lord's mercy endures forever. God takes care of God's supplies. But illustrations, God wants us to see these. And you can, do, you can look in your own life and say, that's when God showed me mercy. God take, took care of things for me. And that's what he did to the people of Israel here in these verses that we just saw tonight. Verse 10 down through the end of the chapter. God is to be thanked because his mercy endureth forever. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Lord, we just want to stop and pause here. To think back of all the times we could come up with one illustration or another. And I'm sure everybody in this auditorium here tonight, if we had time to let them give testimony, they can think of the times that your mercy was shown towards their life. Maybe in protecting them from a car wreck or maybe some need that you met in their life that you, they didn't know where the next dime was coming from. They didn't know where the food was coming to feed their family. But you took care of it. You supplied it. And so, Lord, we're grateful for your mercy that endureth forever. And may we not soon forget the illustrations we've seen here tonight, how you protected us from our enemies even. And, Lord, we thank you for all you've done for us. Lord, bless in this prayer meeting time. May you be glorified in all that we do and say. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. All right.